Channel opens the stock car portion of Speed Weeks. Welcome to Daytona, where it's a nice balmy 80-some degrees, fans sunning themselves in the stands, and the garage area, a beehive of activity as usual. There are changes. Winston red and white, now replaced by Nextel yellow and black. The 76 balls are gone, replaced by the Sunoco diamonds. But otherwise, it looks a lot like past speed weeks. A lot of fast cars in the garage, a lot of drivers waiting to run them and get going on the two and a half mile tri-oval. Let's go right down there to the NASCAR Nextel Cup garage. Marty Snyder. Mike getting ready for the first ever NASCAR Nextel Cup practice. Kevin Harvick won the pole in Indianapolis, where this is a bud shootout practice that we have going on today. Uh, so you're so you're in the race. It's been a long winter. You ready to get going? I think my wife's ready to kick me out of the house. But uh, <laughs> they get yeah. tired of you if you've been there for a while, don't they? I've been there for too long. I know all the guys back at my shop are ready to kick me out, and, and uh, I'm ready to get back where I belong, sitting in the seat of this GM Goodrich Chevrolet. So uh, we're excited. Uh, not many changes on our race team, so there's not much to talk about other than to go out and see where we fall with all the new rules. There's a little bit of talk about with concern to testing. You guys were not very good when you came down here for winter testing. Now, teams wouldn't sandbag, would they, in winter testing, Kevin? I don't know. Have we ever run fast down here in testing? I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Even when Larry Mack was the crew chief, it was kind of a struggle down here. And amazingly, you find about a second and a half when you come back down here. Well, we just we work hard on our cars, and, and these guys work hard on their Speedway program at RCR. So. Um, I guess that's all for everybody to find out here in the next couple days. We'll all we'll see your real hand tomorrow when qualifying happens on NBC. Kevin Harvick, one of the many drivers in the Bud Shootout tomorrow night. Matt Yoakum. Well, Marty, Jimmy Johnson, another driver very eager to get out for practice. And what's what was the first thing you just said when you walked up? Which time? Oh, it's time to get back to work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every, you know, this is, I guess, the first interview, probably. The first interview, getting ready for the first next Hell Cup Series practice here in Daytona. Yeah, vacation's over. Now it's time to get back to work. And talk about getting back to work. New rules, uh, a different size spoiler, new tires. How important is the practice session you're about to go out on and then the one tonight? Yeah, the one we're getting ready to have right now, I think, will show us some things for the 500 with the sun being out. Uh, we're worried about the next session to teach us more for the, the shootout. But with a new tire, it doesn't matter if we're here at Daytona or if we're, you know, like we're in Las Vegas testing on an intermediate track. The tire is different. There's a lot of movement in it on the intermediate track with having less spoiler. It drives different from that. So there's a lot of new things for us to uh, figure out inside the garage area. Uh, starting here at Daytona with a new tire. It's, it's rare to have a tire affect the car by itself. And that's the only way I felt this tire so far. And uh, because we crashed the car when we were testing, I didn't get, get to go out and uh, have drafting practice. So this is uh, first for me, and I'm looking forward to it. Now, you finished seventh last year in your only appearance in the Bud Shootout. What's the biggest memory from last year for you? Uh, when there's just money on the line, you've got to be very greedy and uh, do all that you can to make your moves and, and get things done. But uh, we took some tires on. I think we took four on at the end, and, and it was working for us when we were coming through the pack. But uh, you know, these plate races are so weird. I can get three quarters of whatever ra whatever race it is figured out, but that last little bit, I, I haven't had enough luck with the Los Monte Carlo or whatever it's been going on to get myself in victory lane. Hopefully, we can change that down here uh, in the next two in the next two weeks. And his best restrictor plate finish, a third best finish here in the shootout, his only start last year, which was seven. Mike. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everybody. Mike Joy, Larry McReynolds, and Jeff Hammond. We've set a new record. Uh, it's just the start of our season on speed. Only took the pit boys 45 seconds to throw you under the bus. It didn't, it didn't take long at all. <laughs> no, but Larry, let's talk about some of the challenges that these teams are going to be faced uh, beginning with this Bud Shootout. Well, the good thing is the one challenge they don't are not faced with is qualifying. Everybody's in this show. There's 19 cars. Now, the unique thing is they're going to do these two practice sessions, and they still don't know where they're going to start this race. They're going to draw tonight at kind of a uh, dinner this evening but the difference is you heard Jimmy Johnson talk about it is this new tire it's a softer tire and tomorrow night's format is a 70 lap race you run 20 laps then you get a 10 minute break to possibly correct some of the problems your car has then the real challenge comes in is that 50 lap second segment where we know we're gonna have to stop for fuel with the smaller fuel cells but getting those cars to drive good on a long run that's what these guys are gonna be working on you heard Jimmy Johnson talk about it a little different rules from a year ago same rules as Talladega, a little bigger restrictor plate, more horsepower under the hood, but a little taller rear spoiler that, that hurts the drag down the straightaways, trying to make those cars have a little more throttle response with more horsepower. 
And Jeff, as you look at the drivers who are going to be in this Bud Shootout, there's a wide range of experience and agendas there. There really is, Mike. And what's going on right now? You take a guy like Kevin Harvick, you know, and Matt was talking to him. I'm already talking to him earlier. I mean, he's pretty much ready to go back to work, but he's looking at this test session as an opportunity to learn something about the 500. It's kind of like a ho hum situation. But on the other extreme, you got a guy like Boris said. It's his first opportunity to come to a place like Daytona, get hooked up in the draft, and what he considers run with the pros. I mean, he he is looking for an opportunity to come in here and show these car owners that not only can he run a road course, he can also get it done at Daytona. And to make sure he gets it done properly, he's been working with a lot of other different drivers that he's helped during the course of his road uh, course experience, of sharing that experience with these guys and asking them, what do I need to do? Two guys in particular, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and a guy you know a lot about, Ernie Irvin, uh, Larry, has been helping get Boris kind of tuned up and ready to go for this practice. Yeah, he's been the driver coach, and don't forget about Bill Elliott. Once he runs this race tomorrow night, he's off for the rest of the week. He don't run again probably to Las Vegas, so he kind of has a different agenda as well. Getting set for the first practice session of the stock car part of Speed Weeks. A look at the Bud Pole champion from 2003, the Rocket, Ryan Newman. Track gets ready to open for practice. Speed Channel coverage of Bud Shootout practice is brought to you by New Levitra. New choice here now. Ask your doctor today. And by Nextel, coast to coast walkie talkies in under a second. NASCAR and Nextel, partners in speed. Welcome back to Daytona. There's the defending Bud Shootout champion. Oh, you've seen him at billboards all over town. Shoot, he's been everywhere, has he, Mike? <laughs> I think so. With another contender is Matt Yoakum. Dale Jr. trying for a second Bud Shootout win. Jeff Gordon, you already have two. How exciting is this race from a driver's standpoint? That's uh, very exciting. Uh, I mean, I think it's great for the drivers and, and the fans, uh, especially since they went to the night race. It's pretty spectacular. But, you know, it, just like last year's race, I mean, it came right down to the last few laps. And um, you, now the race is longer. There's a lot of shuffling, a lot of things. But guys get a little bit more comfortable towards the beginning uh, and get into position and kind of uh, stay there until the pit stops. And then at the end, that's, that's when it all goes crazy so it doesn't matter if it's a 10 lap race or 70 lap race or whatever it is uh it's all going to happen in those last five laps now i think the second biggest headline stealer in the off season was actually probably your hair you shaved it off it's starting to grow back yeah i mean i didn't shave it bald but uh it was pretty short and uh it drew a little bit more attention than i thought it would i wasn't trying to do that i just uh I don't know, just, just, just wanted to do it, always wanted to do it, and off season's perfect time to do it, but found out how, how cold your head can get when you do that. <laughs> well, Larry Mack, uh, you may know something a little bit more about uh, stocking caps and cold weather. This is oh, pickle, Larry it Mack. Doesn't, it doesn't let up. <laughs> it really we don't. just started. Really, it's a full court press. Well, keep get it, it out of you guys. Keep no, it out. Get it out of your systems, boys. It's a long season. When they're talking about Larry Mack, that means they're letting somebody else rest. <laughs> oh, <laughs> We'll be back and they'll open the two and a half mile tri oval for Bud Shootout practice after this. Alan, Mikey, and the boys will sort it all out for you. Correct all those misconceptions. That's a fun show. Do what? Yeah. <laughs> hey, a lot of new looks to uh, some of these next Tail Cup cars for 2004. And there's one, Dale Jr. Remember one year ago when he rolled into victory lane in the Bud Shootout? With a slightly different look. And went right on to the twin 125s and in typical Earnhardt like fashion, sped on to victory there. In the bush race. Same song, third verse. It was quite a speed week and for I, Dale Jr. I think I'm confident in saying had the Daytona 500 not been rain shortened, I do believe he was going to make those laps up and be in contention to win. But winning the Bud shootout a year ago, that's how he became eligible to compete this year. He did not sit on a Bud pole in 2003, but all the Bud pole winners from last year, they're eligible. Plus, if you won the Bud shootout in the past, you're eligible for it. Car's got a born-on date. Look there on the hood, right, uh, right above the Chevy bow tie. 
Uh, that car is, isn't that tomorrow? Yeah, that would be right the date of the Bud there. shootout. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> One day premature, but what the heck. Now, Mark Martin has a new look for this race as well. There is a whole supermarket aisle full of sponsors on that car. Kind of like if you're hungry, I think you can find what you're looking for on Mark's car. And, uh, Mike, that right there, believe it or not, is a brand-new race car as we take a look at the planner's uh, display right there behind the number six. But they went home after testing down here. Home after testing down here in Daytona. We're not happy with the car that they had to primarily they picked the run down here and decided, well, guess what? We need to build a brand new car to come back with. They did. This is going to be the first laps on the track for this race car. And he did not sit on a pole last year either. He's eligible like Dale Earnhardt Jr. by winning the 1999 Bud Shootout. Mark, this will be his 16th consecutive start in the Bud Shootout. So there's hot dogs, peanuts, coffee, and cheese. Here's dessert. M&M's. Another new... Uh new paint scheme for uh, Elliot Sadler. Oh, that's right. You remember, uh, they just recently came with the black and white M&Ms. Something new, and that's what they've got on the side of the car. I kept thinking, I said, well, there's no color there, but that is what the rep that's representative of the M&Ms. Okay. And we, we, boy, I can't work. i got to fix the word. Wait a minute. We sit down, strongly Larry. spoke about it last year, about the little tiny star that kept getting smaller and smaller on the 42, and they fixed it. I'm going to tell you what, that right there brings back so many memories uh, right yes. there. Again, the only thing that's different on that car is instead of a 28, it has a 42. That's the paint scheme that Davey Allison won so many races with back in the uh, early 90s. You're shaking right now, Larry. Uh, You're that, shaking. That sends goosebumps. And I guarantee mind. that will now be the easiest car to spot at one mile away as it goes up into turn three. And, uh, of course, Jamie was a late entry into the Bud shootout. He set on the last Bud pole qualifying at uh, Homestead, Miami at the end of last year, November. Do you realize, remember how excited he was after he got through doing that? It was kind of like a big surprise to him. Like, I can't believe I did it. I actually can't believe that I just now set on the pole. Down and, and I'm sure at some point in time he said the word cool. A smoke there from Ryan Newman, and is it that is it that a is, left front row? Left front fender rubbing a little bit right there, getting up to speed. As we talked, a lot of times when these guys get through testing, they go back to the shop, they try to tighten everything back up, and sometimes they don't quite get it like they need it. Yeah, I believe Ryan's going to need to come back in, though, because the faster he gets going, especially when he gets up in a draft, that's, uh, that rub's probably only going to get worse. Looks like he's going to come to pit road and, and fix this. And, you know, that's the thing about this. We keep talking about this new Goodyear tire. Not only is it a softer compound, it's a softer sidewall. And what we have found during all the testing, the tire moves around a lot more. And in other words, a fender or quarter panel width of last year, you had to widen it out this year because the tire was flexing more. Speed Weeks was not kind to Ryan Newman in 2003. He gets in a tussle here, hits gate seven. That arm call right there, tore the right rear from the car. Up in the air it went. And the rest, as they say, is history. Newman was unhurt and came from this 43rd place finish in the 500 right up to near the top of the Winston Cup standings for 2403. The good thing about that crash, I know it looked devastating, and it was, but the car kept moving. It was dissipating energy. It never had that sudden stop. So a quick lap, no, a quick slow lap for Ryan and back to the garage for a little fender work. And Mike, let's explain right now the reason why you saw that smoke. You think, well, golly, don't these guys know what they're doing? But what they try to do when they go back to the shop is keep the car as small as possible so it'll go through the air in the least amount of drag so the car runs faster. So that's the reason why sometimes they miss it just a little bit. They won't have to do a, move a lot on it, but they will beat it out just enough to let it clear. Matt's there. Matt Borland, crew chief, talking to Ryan Newman on the radio. Actually, Tony Stewart radioed his spotter, Jeff Gooch Patterson, and said, tell the 12 team their left front is rubbing badly. And when he did pull it in, you could see the line on the outside sidewall of that tire. You can see where that fender was rubbing. The hood's up. They're going to make some adjustments and fix that. All right, we'll go out on track as Newman goes back to the garage. And let's clear up right now. Are the teams required to run a different car in the Bud shootout than they're going to have inspected and run for the 500? No, they're not. If they so choose, they can run the same car all the way through. But most of these teams elect to bring a separate car because, again, they realize that this is an all-out 
basically a shootout and they want to get into a situation where if they need to beat and bang a little bit and all of a sudden they don't wind up losing their best car, which they want to put all our hopes on for the 500. Bobby Labonte and Tony Stewart, the Joe Gibbs Racing teammates who did not change color schemes or much of anything else this year. Once again, back in Chevrolets. Because that's another thing that's absent here for Speed Weeks 2004 is Pontiac. Pontiac has decided to uh, take their racing budget and go road racing. And they're not involved in Nextel Cup this year. It's all it's Chevys, Fords, and Dodge. Yeah, in, in this particular race, we'll have seven Fords, nine Chevrolets, and three Dodges. And look at Tony's first Bob Labonte. Their owner decided to make a change and go back to coaching football here. And take his younger son with him. Coy Gibbs is going to be an assistant to his dad with the Washington Redskins. He was a first series driver last year. Well, you got to talk about that. You got to talk about his older son, J.D. What a great job he's done with the race team. And I think that's one thing that allowed Joe Gibbs to make this decision because he knew that this race team was in very competent hands. He's got Jimmy Maycar out there, kind of like the general manager in control of all the racing stuff. J.D. handles the business side of it. So all that kind of gives these guys an opportunity to do their thing while Daddy goes back and does what he does best, which is coach. He's a great coach, great motivator. He built this race team just like he had his football teams. And I think that's what he needs to be doing. I saw it look like some smoke when he come off the right front of Tony Stewart's car when he went down in the one corner, too. We'll keep an eye on that. Another thing that has not changed here at Daytona is the room of doom. Marty Snyder is in the NASCAR inspection station. Oh, it's in full, full effect this weekend. This is the hardest thing to get today. It's the green inspection sticker. Goes on top of the windshield. Once it's on there, that means that your car has passed inspection. They had to send both the 500 cars and the Bud shootout cars through inspection today. Some teams got through on the first try. Some teams it took quite a long time to get through. Here's just a couple of the parts that were confiscated. The rear deck lid off Jeremy Mayfield's car did not fit the template, but the one everyone was talking about off Kurt Busch's car. A bar in the rear bumper that weighs about 70 pounds instead of the normal five pounds it should weigh, and that would keep the rear deck lid down, therefore the rear spoiler out of the air, therefore making the car faster. Not a bad idea, but it was tried a few years ago, so NASCAR was looking for it. Larry, I can't believe these teams would try such things. Can you? Absolutely not. I know Hammond never did anything like that. I, I never had to. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny Schrader's new paint job there in the middle of that sandwich. There are several places NASCAR allows teams to add ballast, and that reinforcing bar is not one of them. No, that, Definitely could, you know, that could be. Uh, they want that area to have a little bit of give to it back there in the rear bumper area. Let's talk about some of these new schemes and new colors. Kenny Schrader picking up Schwann's uh, home delivery food service. As the sponsor of BAM Racing, this is for the entire 2004 season. I know that right team right there is, is very motivated right now because of the fact they've got this sponsor on board last year. Uh, Beth Ann Mor Morgenthal and that whole group over there pretty much did it out of their pocket. And, it, you know, it put a big strain on everybody. And it's just one of those kind of situations where when you got a sponsor, you feel like you're doing things right. And right there toward the end of the season, things have picked up for this 49 car. And I think maybe if they start the season off, it'll be good for them having that sponsor. Two drivers are eligible for the Bud Shootout, but do not have rides. One is Steve Park, and the other is Jeff Green, who drives for this man, Richard Petty. Richard promised his mama there wouldn't be decals on the Petty cars, and there still aren't. So the Petties will sit out the shootout. Sunday, Sunday, I've always wanted to do that. Speed News NASCAR Edition kicks it off at 7. Speed News World Class half an hour later in NASCAR Victory Lane at 8. It's all on speed or else. 13 cars mixing it up in the lead draft. It's the only draft of practice right now. We're just getting used to saying lead draft. And look at that old one right center screen. Boris Badenoff is good enough for the top spot on the speed chart. But Mike, watching him out there in practice, he said earlier he was going to get at the back of the pack and try to learn what the draft does for him or well, what he was able to do. He caught three guys, three wide, and he's able to suck up on them. And he got himself a really fast lap right there, but he's being smart. He went on around past his pack that's coming in. He's going to try to run a few more laps, get used to this race car here at Daytona, how it feels on the high banks. And again, He's got a big learning curve in front of him, but I think he's really uh, prepared for it. Yeah, I mean, I know Ryan Pemberton and that group, they want to get this car as good as they can, but the biggest agenda that this group has, and I think we've got a red flag out for some reason, is just like you say, Jeff Boris, getting as many laps as he can on this racetrack in draft configuration. We're hearing that there's all on the racetrack right now. That's the reason the red flag's displayed. 
Larry, you know, really, it's, that's one thing you cannot stand to have on the oil on this racetrack, because again, that'll get you in trouble when you're running about 190 miles an hour, three wide. Here's the suspect, Jeff Gordon. And looking at where the cars turned into the garage, I don't see a trail of oil on the pavement anywhere, but we'll have a further look. And so will the NASCAR officials. You know, in the opening of our show, we talked about the agendas of these teams. One of the biggest things they're trying to learn right now is what their fuel mileage is going to be, especially for that second segment. Because last year in this race, they could run about 35 laps. But as I mentioned earlier, a little bigger restrictor played about 25 more horsepower. It's going to use more fuel. Even though they have the numbers from Talladega, I talked to Ray Evernham. He said that's going to be a big deal is try to figure out how far we can actually run on fuel for all the races this week. There was a puff of smoke off Jeff Gordon's car. Let's uh, see if we have it in replay here. Yeah, that had all the look of maybe of a, of a tire rub right there because that's a, quite a bump over there in turn one, going into turn one, so I'm not sure on that one. Certainly this early in the day, no problem, no foul in waving the red flag to have a look around. Marty? Mike, just listening to the uh, radio conversation between Robbie Loomis and Jeff Gordon, Jeff said it felt like the entire uh, bottom section of the tailpipes rubbed on the ground and the entire left side of the car hit the ground. So it was, it was kind of a bottoming out situation is what he said it felt like to him. There was smoke, but nothing wrong with the engine. Show you what that back bumper looks like, and it doesn't look like bottoming out. It looks like oil to me, Mike. If you look right there, it looks kind of oily. You see the streaks right now coming down the paint scheme right there on the car. It looks like it's got a film of oil on it. Maybe if Marty can step over and just run his finger across it, you'll be able to tell pretty quickly, but it does look like it's been leaking or blowing out some oil. Now that'll be fluid that came out from under the car and then due to the airflow, was swept back up and stuck to the rear bumper. Marty, you there? Yeah, I just talked to Jeff Andrews, one of the head engine people for Hendrick Motorsports. He said that is gear oil, so they're going to investigate. Maybe, uh, I don't know, Larry Mack, maybe it bottomed out and then something happened with the gear. Maybe that could have been the case. Matt. Marty, Marty, did he say that with a sigh of relief since he's the engine yes, guy? Yes, he did. I'll he bet said, he did. He said, he said that's gear oil, it's not motor oil. He made that point. <laughs> Matt. And here in the bug garage, Tony, Yuri Jr., the car, you've been bouncing back and forth with the inspection line with your 500 car, your bud shootout car, how is it? Pretty good. Uh, got a little, got a little bit of a tight condition on it, but we're trying some different things that we normally didn't uh, run here. So, uh, go put the original setup that we always run here and try it for a couple laps. Just mainly wanted to make sure we wasn't had no tire rubs or nothing like that. And uh, the, the 500 car is doing good. They're bolting the spoiler on it right now. Really, this car had more trouble than it. So uh, we're looking good for this weekend. And Junior's new spotter, Stevie Reeves, the former USAC midget champ, told Junior on the radio, he said, Tony Stewart kept trying to hang back and get a run on you, but he could not. He could only get up to your backside, so that's definitely a good sign here in this early session. And Matt, that's the biggest thing that's going on in this practice right now because Dale Earnhardt Jr. this entire speed week is going to be hearing a different voice than he's ever heard from his spotter, Stevie Rees, because the guy that has spotted for him all the way even back into the Bush Series, Ty Norris, is no longer with Dale Earnhardt Incorporated. Look at the spotter's perch. There's uh, Rick Cordell up there getting a tan, closest to camera in the top row, and everybody else just chatting it over as we're under the red flag for Nextel Cup Bud Shootout practice at Daytona. The 41st annual Advanced Discount Auto Parts 200 is on speed tomorrow live at 3.30 p.m. First won by Nelson Stacy in a Ford in 1964. And then by Iggy Katona and a whole host of luminaries, including Benny Parsons, Kyle Petty, Tim Richmond, on and on. The Arca cars at Daytona tomorrow. There's the spotter stand. Guys, that's looking there just a minute ago. If you'll notice right here, look at this young man right there in that GM cat right there. That right there is Brian Vickers, last year's Bush Grand National Champion, and his owner, Ricky Hendrick, and the other head sitting right there in a the brown shirt with his back to us. But these guys are up there, I'm sure, trying to coach him as far as watch what's going on on the racetrack so you can start learning how to get better about what's going on. Well, let's find out about that uh, 
fluid on the back of the 24. And what else is going on there for Marty? Well, it was an interesting uh, five minutes of practice for Jeff Gordon. You said it, you felt like it hit the entire bottom of the car and then the left side really hard. What happened, Jeff? Well, I don't think that has anything to do with what happened there. Uh, we're not sure. I think I think it's engine oil, um, but, I mean, we didn't overfill it or anything like that, so we're trying to figure out exactly where it's coming from. Motor was running good. It did bottom out. You know, we, we just need to clear it some things underneath the car. Uh, felt real good. Uh, yeah, I was having fun up to that point, and they're, they're telling me, you know, I got something. I'm like, it's not me. It's not me. I don't have anything back. And, uh, you know, I saw that everybody cleared out behind me, so I figured that's a pretty good indication there is something there. Very good. Jeff Andrews wanted to point out that that's green. That's gear oil, not engine oil. He was quick to point that out. Well, maybe that's what it is. We're not sure yet. They got a lot to figure out here on the 24, but uh, we'll get him back out in this practice session, hopefully, guys. Jeff Gordon, sixth fastest on the speed chart. 17 drivers have been on track, including four competing in their first ever Bud Shootout. Boris said, Jamie McMurray, Dave Blaney, and Elliot Sadler. Fantasy Cup Auto Racing is now the official fantasy game of Speed Channel. Select your team of eight Nextel Cup drivers, score weekly fantasy points while staying within your fantasy budget. The grand prize winner receives not a fantasy, but $25,000. Log on to SpeedTV.com and click on the Fantasy Cup Auto Racing banner at the top of the page. More than three quarters of a million in weekly and year-end prizes will be given away in 2004. That's more money than the drivers made not too many years ago. We can race that, Michael. Are we eligible for that? <laughs> can we compete? Track not yet open, still under the red flag, as they did a little bit of uh, check around uh, for falling parts and fluid. Still the uh, track truck working down in turn one as Dale Jr. rolls up. Fifth in line. Okay. Safety car out. Going to be a new look to the safety car for the Daytona 500. It's uh, got Disney characters all over it. My uh, three and four year old were very quick to notice as we drove past Daytona USA. Big Mickey Mouse all over the uh, Daytona 500 pace car. Does that include Buster Alton? Well, I'm not going to tell him you said that. <laughs> Who, what Disney character does uh, does Buster most resemble? Let's see. Foghorn Leghorn is not a Disney character, is it? Uh, I don't think no, so. No, it's Warner Brothers, but don't worry. We'll, we'll find one before the week's out. And we talk about Buster Alton. He is a guy that's been driving the pace car for a long time, and he does an outstanding job usually checking the racetrack out and making sure it's safe enough for the drivers to continue. Here's a real character, Matt Yoakum. Tony Stewart, a two-time Bud Shootout winner. First off, I know the one in 2001, very special. You have that car in your museum, don't you? Yeah, actually, that car is in, in Denver, North Carolina, where my race shop is over there. We uh, we bought it from Joe Gibbs Racing when they decided they were going to sell it. And I said, you know, since that was a, one of the, almost the last race I got to run with Dale Earnhardt, and we got to beat him with that car, that was uh, a car that was pretty special to us. So I bought that one. And uh, it's there with the uh, championship car, the first win car, and the Daytona crash car right now. Look, looking ahead to Saturday night's big shootout here, working on this practice session, I saw the engine guys changing a carburetor. What are you working on right now, Smoke? Speed. <laughs> we have a, a serious lack thereof so far, but uh, you know that's the thing about this Home Depot team. I mean, they'll they'll keep changing stuff till we find something that's working. There's something that that it's missing right now, and uh, you know, with it in the draft, it didn't really lead that fast either. So uh, uh, we're just trying to search for some speed uh, in, in every aspect of it right now. And you heard a lot of people talk about sucking up, and Larry Mack, that's exactly what they're trying to work on. They didn't feel like that Tony's car sucked up. As you heard Stevie Reeves tell Junior, it's just not sucking up like the 20 team would like, and they're going to change carbs and try to work on it some more. And what that means, when he gets to a pack of cars, it won't go ahead and go up to him, and that can be gearing. It can be the cowl opening at the base of the windshield, at the back of the hood. It can be several things they're trying to work on to where that car will go ahead and either be able to pull out with some help and make a pass or at least get to the pack. Now, I can understand drivers wanting to keep cars in which they won really big races, but let's show you this piece of tape and wonder why Tony wants to keep this car in his shop in Denver, North Carolina, because this thing went for a wild ride. And he was running up near the back of the pack, and one of the cars that he rolled over right there hooked together is his teammate, Bobby Labonte, in the 18 car. Bobby was running near the rear of the pack. And that, that was race. their strategy. Tony wanted to be up front, Bobby wanted to be out back, and they ended up almost welded together there. It's yep. hard to believe that he actually wound on top of several cars during that whole accident right there. Matt? I asked Tony that very question. Why keep 
that remembrance of that day. And he said, well, basically they were going to scrap the car because it was so bad. And I said, well, it looks kind of cool. I'll just take it home, put it in my own museum, my own garage. Well, that's pretty cool. But Matt, let's uh, let's just verify for the folks. This is not a museum that's open to the public. This that is, is just Tony Stewart's his personal, personal museum. collection. Kind of right. like if you're a baseball card person, you have a, a big box of baseball cards at home. Well, he collects race cars. He has a car when he won the Chili Bowl, USAC uh, championship cars from the Glenn Nibel era, and, and a lot of different things that he likes to keep for his own personal mementos. Let's go back to Marty and put a period on the Jeff Gordon story. Well, let's uh, indeed put a period on this Jeff Gordon story. Jeff Andrews, any uh, definitive answers as to what happened with the car? Uh, Marty, I just think we just um, had the oil level a little bit too high. Oil temperatures got up, so drop the oil level down a little bit and take some tape off of it and go back out. That makes oil expand, therefore come out of the oil overflow, yeah, correct? Pushed it out of a breather tank there that's in the trunk, so drop it down a little bit and go back out. Even the engine guys can get it wrong. It, it was indeed engine oil on the back of the Jeff Gordon's car, but they should have them fixed up here pretty soon and back out on the track. A lot of coated carbon fiber right there. And we'll be back to Daytona, where they'll crank it up and reopen the track for butt shootout practice. One of the greatest things about coming to Daytona in February is that first chance to listen to the sounds of speed. So we're going to let you. Cup ride as they put him in the team car. Now, Mike will compete in the Daytona 500 in a fourth Richard Childress racing ride, but for the Bud shootout, he's in the 10 car. There you look out just in front of that pack right there, you'll see the old one car up there said he kind of lost a draft, and right now he's trying to figure out how to get back up into that pack as they gain on him. So it's going to be interesting to see if he can make that move and get up to speed and run with these guys. He's going to school. Going to school. And there on the bottom, you saw Bill Elliott come through the tri-oval. Mike Skinner out front, but Elliott's been working the bottom. And what's new about Bill Elliott, aside from the fact that he's not going to race full-time in 2004, is that he has relinquished the number nine, which is held by Everham Motorsports. And Elliott's going to run as 91 in the races in which he does compete, including tomorrow night. You know, I spent a little time talking to Ray Everham this morning. Hard to believe, like Dodge, this is Ray Everham's fourth year of Everham Motorsports. And you know, Ray had an interesting point. He said, I look over there at Hendrick's truck and trailers, and on it it has, you know, like the 20th anniversary of that operation. And he said, I'm really proud that this, we've been in business for three years, and at least we've had one win and a butt pole in each of those seasons with our cars. He's very proud of that fact, and he should be. Bill Elliott with a big win at Rockingham in the next to last race of 2003. And he very nearly won the final Winston Cup race ever. The one at Homestead. This game's so close. About a half a lap away had that tire go down on him. But I was listening to the interview right there that Bill did the other day, and he said this Speed Week is going to be kind of a bittersweet situation because he's going to miss so much about it. But at the same time, he knows it's time to make a change, and he's looking forward to doing a lot more different things with his son and, and just have an opportunity to have some fun. As you take a look right here, coming up off of turn two, that tire was going down. His car got extremely loose, and Bobby Labonte was able to get by him 
and steal that victory right there with less than half a lap to go. I talked to Bill yesterday. He, he's really enjoying doing what he's doing right now. And, and I'm going to tell you, he's he's been pretty impressed with this Casey Kane that's going to be driving this nine car. Ray Everham's actually going to be spotting for Bill Elliott tomorrow night in the Bud Shootout. And Ray told me this morning for all these practices today, he will have Casey Kane up here on the roof with him looking on. Jamie McMurray, 42. Jimmy Johnson, 48. And that 23 is Dave Blaney. Whelan Enterprises out of Chester, Connecticut, that makes the uh, caution lights and uh, the police car lights some of you may be familiar with uh, have jumped on board. The 23-4, the Bud Shootout, which we're told could be the Bud Freeze Out tomorrow night. It's going to be cold here in Daytona. A lot cooler than we're probably experiencing today or tonight. It's supposed to be maybe in the low 50s. Pit stop time. Uh, for us, that is. We'll be right back with more Bud Shootout practice on speed. More Bud Shootout practice tonight, 6.30 p.m., live and under the lights from Daytona, right here on speed. Well, speaking of speed chart, it's changed. Kevin Harvick at the top. Rusty Wallace right there in the deuce. In second, Boris Set dropped to third. Bill Elliott fourth fastest. Mike, I've been watching that two car, Rusty Wallace, and he was way at the back of the screws. And I thought for a second he wasn't going to be able to catch up, and all of a sudden, here he comes. He's got a pretty fast ride right now. He's been able to work his way back up into this pack. And he's looking pretty quick right now. You think this is all work? I don't know. Let's have a look at uh, car number eight and Dale Jr. Fussing with uh, Jeremy here. Got quite a good run off turn two. We're going to go up there to a little bump draft down the back straightaway. I guarantee he was grinning and laughing. Oh, well, was that a brake lock up on Jeremy? A little bit of smoke there, and he cut it down pit road. I don't know what happened, Mike. I looked up, and all of a sudden, I seen tire smoke coming up off the 42 car, and it looked like brake smoke. So maybe he was just trying to check things out and see how hard he could come in for that pit stop they got to make tomorrow night. There you go. Remember, it's been a long time since these guys made a green flag stop, and you want to get all you can if you do have to make that green flag stop tomorrow night in that second 50-lap uh, segment. So you want to kind of check things out. Great point. Practice is not confined to running top speed on the racetrack. Now, these guys are getting ready to race, and I think, again, that's what we got to keep pointing out, is this is a race set up they're putting on these cars. When they're watching the number of laps that have been run by a lot of these teams, they're starting to get an idea about what the cars are doing. they got 18, 19 laps in their car. Balance is starting to change. They're starting to think about fuel mileage. So a lot of things are going on during this practice. Marty? Mike, I believe he called Mark Martin's car the grocery aisle car, correct? It's got all this stuff in the grocery aisle yes. all over it. Yeah, very good. Uh, it's actually a very rare car for Daytona. It's brand new, never been tested. Pat Trice and the crew chief, new crew, new crew chief for Mark Martin, was trying to get this car done to get down here for January testing. Couldn't get it done. So right now, they're working the bugs out of this car where everybody else is kind of fine-tuning. They're just trying to get this car, car to go the way Mark wants it to go. He describes it as darty, won't stay in line like he wants it to, and it cuts too easily. That doesn't sound like a very fun car to having a three-wide draft to me tomorrow night. Well, if you show us the top of that left front fender, Jeff Hammond can explain why. One reason. Notice right here, guys, they've already been working on this car because it's rubbing a little bit. They've had to beat it out just a little bit just above the Goodyear. You can see where the hammer prints are. That's because it's been rubbing the fender. Not unusual for a new car to have fender rubs all the way. Well, no, and you know, here at, at Daytona and Talladega at the restricted plate racetracks, NASCAR mandates the spring rate in the rear of the car. You can't be softer than 350 pounds. The softer the spring, the more the car will travel in the back and get the spore out of there. But it don't mandate the front springs for teams once once again, like everywhere we go, they try to get those front springs softer and softer, get the car on the ground, but you got to be careful. You get it so soft, it'll actually kick the rear of the car up in the air and kick the spoiler up. So it's a real balance in that between getting a set of front springs to get it on the ground, but to complement those great, great rear springs. Question of balance. Kevin Harvick continues to top the speed chart. And we'll point out again that that's not necessarily indicative of top speed, but of a car's ability to suck up to the pack, leaving a gap as they come across the line one lap, and then closing up to the pack on the next lap will give you a faster time than the car running out in front of that pack. 
Now, Mike, would you believe this right here, that sometimes you have a car that will pull up to that pack, but when he gets up there and all that air gets kind of disturbed, guess what? The car kind of quits running all over again, so now you got to go back, rethink the package, and try to work with it. It looks to me right now that uh, Rusty Wallace has got his old car working pretty good. Up high, down low, and he's able to catch up with this guy and see if he can make his way all the way to the front and see if he can lead. And it's almost like the cars that have some time on them, they're, they're probably able to accomplish more because this car that Rusty Wallace has here is the car he raced here in July and at Talladega in October. You look at Kevin Harvick's car, that's the car that he raced at all four restricted plate racetracks, so they've worked a lot of those bugs out already. But shootout practice continues at Daytona International Speedway on speed after this. You'll see them all tomorrow morning on speed as NASCAR Nextel Cup practice opens tomorrow, 10 a.m. live. All the entries for the Daytona 500 will be on track for practice. Join us tomorrow morning, and don't forget more Bud Shootout practice coming later this evening on speed. See teammates there, Ryan Newman in the 12 car, Rusty Wallace in the 2 car, and Dodges. And I need to correct something I said earlier. I said there were seven Fords and three Dodges. I need to reverse that. There's only seven Dodges. When you talk about aero changes from last year, the Dodge is getting a new tail section, the Ford's getting a new nose and a new tail, and a new cylinder head, but I talked to Robert Yates this morning. They're not really using that new cylinder head here with their restrictor plate package. They felt like they had a pretty good package. It's something they're working on for the future. Probably the first time we're actually going to see it on the racetrack would be like Texas, possibly. Shootout, and he's going to miss the Daytona 500 for the first time since 1980. Let's get out of Elliott's garage. He will make his 19th start in the Bud Shootout tomorrow night. On his way back into the garage, Bill Elliott was telling his crew chief Sammy Johns about the car. He says, The changes we made, it has helped the car. Still not sucking up like we would like. It's still a little bit tight. And he says, But you know, I think I know what we need to do. Um, let me wait till we get back in the garage, and I'll tell you. And Sammy hasn't taken his head out the driver's side window up until just about now and I, I spoke to Tommy Baldwin the crew chief on the nine I said how is the car sucking up on a scale of one to ten he goes it's just pretty sucky right now <laughs> could be good or bad if you're right <laughs> this car is unsponsored Ray Evernham's charity foundation racing for a reason is supporting the leukemia and lymphoma society fighting blood related cancer a charity that's very dear to the Evernham's heart and experience and uh, very nice that they have taken on that effort in that this car is unsponsored for tomorrow night. And you know, you might wonder, well, why didn't Bill go ahead and just tell Sammy Johns on the radio what he wanted to do? And what we have to remember is there's not a team in that garage area that's not monitoring what other teams are saying on their radio. So let me just tell you in private. Right. Not to mention a few guys up in the booth. We listen to. That's right. We listen to. Jeff Gordon back on track after uh, lowering the oil level and making associated changes on his DuPont Chevy, Ryan Newman, Mark Martin in a car I'm going to have to get used to looking at because it's not blue and silver, but it's uh, the gross. We're going to call it the grocery cart, Mark. Hope you don't mind, but that's, that's a load of vittles <laughs> on that number six car. I keep looking at that Oscar Meyer and you keep thinking about a hot dog. I want somebody to go out and get me one here in a few minutes if uh, I get hungry. I don't think they put the Wiener Mobile in the wind tunnel, but I don't think the aero numbers that would blow would be very good for here. Now, it's going to be interesting to see if they've got that oiling problem corrected in this 24 car, because again, this is not for the 500, but if they have to change engines, it can affect him a little bit about where he starts, and it may cut into some of his practice time if they don't have an opportunity to get it quickly enough, because tonight is going to be real important for a lot of these guys to get a really good feel for these race cars under the lights after the track cools down. And that tank we saw earlier, that little carbon fiber tank, what that is, is kind of a catch can for the overflow for the oil. And what they'll do, they'll want to run as many laps as they can here in this practice. As soon as this practice is over, look at their oil level in particular, see if any oil has went back into that little catch tank. And 
look at experience right now as far as Jeff Gordon's done here. He's dropped the back of his group right here. He's running with them to try to get that oil temperature back up to see if it's going to push them out. But he also doesn't want to get in front of a lot of these guys in case it is blowing out and get on their windshield. So he's probably got his spot. Everybody kind of watch and see what's going on. If they see any oil start to you know, kind of like leak out of the car, he'll come back to pit road. But he'll run a few laps here, come back down on pit road and see if everything's good. Now, for years and years, teams use those uh, lightweight spun aluminum for the oil. And now we see carbon fiber. Why? It's much lighter. Much lighter you know, yet. Anything we can do to reduce weight on these race cars, especially in that area, that's all it's doing is catching excess oil, then we want to put it on there. You know what that makes lighter? The car owner's wallet. I mean, I've always said I can show you how to make three, you know, a, a million dollars in racing yeah. and bring me three million. <laughs> what you're trying to say is we want to make a small fortune in racing, start with a large. You got it. <laughs> but again, Michael, if we're talking about this car need to mount these tanks fairly high in, you know, in relation to the oil tank inside the car. And when you have that kind of weight, you want to keep it as light as possible when you got to put it up. Kevin Harvick, Rusty Wallace, Morris set on top of the speed chart in this opening round of practice for the Budweiser shootout cars. Welcome back to Bud Shootout Practice. Mike Joy, Larry McReynolds, Jeff Hammond, along with uh, Matt Yoakum in the garage area, and Marty Snyder. Marty? Well, Elliot Sadler's in the Bud Shootout via polls at uh, Talladega and Darlington, and uh, you won the poll at Talladega, and you've got an awfully fast race car there. It's not often the crew chief says, come in, it's too good. Uh, that's what Todd just called me and told me. Uh, bring it in, it's, uh, this M&M's four tours is fast, and uh, the boys have done their homework this winter. A lot of hard work's going into it in the engine shop and in the, in the fab shop, and it's showing. That's uh, by far the best uh, Speedway car I've ever had, so we're going to do a few miles check on it, make sure we know how many gallons we can pick up and kind of go from there, but as far as setup and engine tuning, all, I think Robert's seen all what he needs to see, so we should be in good shape. You trust what you find today because it's going to be uh, probably 25 degrees warmer today than it's going to be tomorrow night. Yeah, we might make a few laps tonight and just see what, what type of changes the track offers us, but we got a lot of adjustability built in this thing, too. That's what makes us happier, and, and uh, we even got one just a little bit better sitting here with a cover on for the 500, so, so far, so good. We had a great test down here, and it seems to be uh, paying off for us, but the, the guys have done good. I appreciate the hard work, and want to get them in victory lane very badly. I don't tell the guys in the paint booth they forgot all the color because it's all, they left all the color off the car. If it keeps running like that, we're not going to let M&M's put the color back on in here in a couple months. We're going to leave it just like it says. And you were big on getting the guys to put in an escape hatch for the Daytona 500, weren't you? Yeah, uh, that's. it takes a lot of extra hard work in the shop, a few more days in the fab shop. But I'm a pretty big guy, and so is DJ, so we have escape hatches in all of our cars. and. That just shows how much our guys care about us and how much they think of us and don't want us to get hurt. So I hope we don't have to use it unless it's to come out in victory lane, but it's there just in case. So that will be there for every car for this year? Yes, sir. Every car that uh, the M&M's Ford Taurus logos are on will have an escape hatch on it. So i got to say thank you to the guys back at the shop. We really appreciate the hard work. All right, plan a nice victory dance out of the escape hatch. <laughs> All right, thank you. Now, we talked a minute ago about reducing weight up high. This is an area where the team has sacrificed by adding weight at the very, very top of the car to give the driver an extra measure of comfort and safety. Yeah, because it's an optional item that NASCAR has put forth. And yeah, it, it weighs a lot. And that's definitely the wrong place to put it as far as weight. But how about this wreck last year? This was near the end of the race at Talladega in October. Elliott Sadler getting together on the back stretch. And you're talking about a hard, hard crash. Even though that car kept moving and dissipating energy, it took some hard licks as it was rolling end over end, side over side here. Larry, I remember whenever I was talking to Elliot after this, he said every time that car hit, he said it just kept knocking the air out of me. He said, can you believe it? He said about the fourth time, he said there was nothing else to come out. He said it, it took me a while to get my breath, but he said fortunately, he said I came out of there basically unscathed, just got the wind really knocked out of me. Of course, Elliot Sadler will be making his very first career start in a bud shootout, but he's had some good runs here. In fact, back in 2002, Driving for the Wood Brothers, he finished second in the Daytona 500. Kevin Harvick, fastest in practice, and his practice speed is right at the fastest uh, test speed. Ricky Rutt posted 47 and a half 
seconds, just about a tenth or so off it. There's the fastest man so far. But again, Ricky Rudd's test speed, that was a, a speed by himself on a two-lap qualifying mock effort. So it's a little deceiving comparing that speed to Ricky Rudd's, but definitely I think the speeds this speed weeks, because of the bigger restrictor plate, they're going to be much quicker in race trim and qualifying trim than they were a year ago. Speaking of deceiving, Larry, you know, we just got through interviewing Elliot Sadler, and he was talking about how good his race car is. But do you find it a little bit funny to see Elliot at the, pretty much the bottom of the list being that happy with his race car? Well, again, they know that speed chart is deceiving. You know, mm -hmm. if that car is driving good, you know, we talked about these teams in the beginning of the show making long runs. Even though this is a restricted plate racetrack, it's about arrow and horsepower. At the end of the day, in a 50-lap run like they have to run in the second segment tomorrow night, Jeff, you know it and I know it, handling is what will win that race at the end of the day. A lot of times what happens here at a place like Daytona is the cars get pushing off the corner and the driver has to kind of squeeze up out of throttle. And that's when you start getting out run. So that's what these guys are looking for. Make the car handle good that long run. Getting ready for dinner. I believe it's about dinner time too. Uh, a little more practice to go first right after this. Tony Stewart and Dale Jr. Uh, kicking up a lot of dust and maybe somebody getting a little paint off the wall coming off turn number two here at Daytona. As the shootout practice rolls on, Jr. is going to bring his car to the garage. Perhaps as a consequence, perhaps not. Perhaps he's just had enough. <laughs> right side looks okay. Yeah, but somebody definitely, Mike, was high up off of turn two because we saw the speedy drive just flying for sure as they came off of turn two a second ago. But as you look out front right there, old Jeff Gordon, he's looking pretty stout, running a lot of laps right now, trying, I guess, to find out whether or not to balance his race car is where he wants. Rusty Wallace and Boris said have run the most laps of this session, 26 apiece. As we look at Dave Blaney, Jeremy Mayfield, and Kevin Harvick. Really have those big packs of cars out there right now. You know, several of them ran in about 12, 13, 14 packs of cars earlier in the session, but now some of the cars are starting to dwindle away a little bit. Let's have another look there at turn two just before we came back from break. Tony. There's Tony up there. Just kicked up a little dust. Matt? Dale Jr. pulling his car back into the garage, basically giving a diagnosis to car chief Tony Uri Jr. says the car, it just, it's like when I turn the wheel, it wants to go right up the hill, means climbing the bank and up to the higher line. They're gonna make a chassis adjustment, probably change also the right rear spring. He also said that he wants to take a little more tape off the grill. The car running 235, 240 water temperature when he's in the draft, but he's also picked up a vibration. He says when the car gets tighter, the vibration and severity of it increases. So they're gonna to try to work on that as well, possibly changing the right front spring as well as the right rear spring, Marty. Well, Dale Jarrett, uh, are you as happy as your teammate is? He's, he's extremely happy with his car. I saw him over there smiling, so that's good. Uh, we both had a good test, and uh, it's fun to get back out here and do a little drafting. But my car's good. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, we're just doing some different things to, to see how it affects the car. And uh, you know, I've, I've been able to lead the pack, and I've been able to get back and make a few passes. So uh, that's all you can ask for. Everybody talked about the new softer tires absolutely changing the games at the intermediate tracks, but how has it changed the game here at Daytona? Yeah, it's going to change here too. Uh, with the racing surface being as worn as what it is here, handling comes into effect quite a bit. And uh, you're going to have a hard time putting on two tires if you've got any length of time on your left. So uh, it's definitely going to change the way that you think. And you better have a really good handling car if you're going to throw two tires at it because it could get to be a handful. All right, so what's the driver won that last stop tomorrow night, two or four? Uh, I think I'm going to be asking for four, but I'll let my crew chief decide that. And uh, if he says two, then I'll hang on and make the most of it and do what I can.
Larry Mack, you get them two or four tomorrow night? I believe I'm going to go with DJ. I believe you're going to have to give them four here. I believe, uh, and I he believe agrees with you. Larry Mack agrees with you. Thank you, Larry Mack. And you yeah, know, I appreciate that. That's why we got along whenever uh, we, we were together. So, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be four. Be interesting to see, though. Somebody's going to take two. We'll see how it works out. You really think someone will try it? I think somebody will, just trying to get uh, to the front, get themselves in a position, and uh, we'll see how that works. And hang on, right? Hang on. <laughs> you better believe it'll be hanging on. But you hear Dale Jarrett talking about his crew chief. He's working with a new crew chief this year. Mike Ford moved over from Ray Everham, who was Bill Elliott's crew chief last last couple years. And he's over there now with DJ as his crew chief. Mike Ford was there in the beginning when that 88 team was created in 1996 as the car chief. We'll have a lot more on all the changes in Nextel Cup for 2004 tomorrow morning with our first Nextel Cup practice session. More to come here from Daytona. Stay with us. Welcome back to Daytona. Yes, we're patriotic on Speed Channel, but that is also Larry Max weather flag. Yeah, I mean, they have a lot of high-dollar weather stations down there, but I always watch this flag, and, Jeff, this can cause a lot of problems for cars. Now, it's going to help the car go down the backstretch because it has a tailwind, but the big thing it'll play is off turn four. It'll make the cars want to push, but we're going to go back and show you this situation that happened a while ago with Tony Stewart Dale Earnhardt Jr., and, Jeff, I think a similar thing happened over there in turn two. Yeah, what happened out there, Dale Earnhardt Jr. is coming up on that 20 car Tony Stewart and that air actually hit him on the left rear quarter panel and right there it makes it so light the back end is kind of set over on the 20 car just notice right here just coming up off the corner they aren't doing this banner this low enough that when he comes up air off his car right kind of like pushing me up just a little bit you see Dale kind of move down the low side real quick thinking oh I've kind of got my buddy in trouble here Tony Stewart did a really good job of hanging on that place. It's one of the waste, worst positions you can be in on a car is right there at that left rear. Right there is the same thing that happened to us in the 1997 Daytona 500 with Dale Earnhardt with about 11 or 12 laps to go. Jeff Gordon made a run on him right to that left rear quarter. Didn't touch him, but took the air off that part of the car, and that's when we ended up rolling down the back stretch. And that's exactly what you do during these practice sessions. You try to find out what your car is good at doing so you can take advantage of your competition. This is part of what goes on tomorrow night it'll be all that's going on is guys will be pushing and trying to loosen one another up to get position so they can win this race marty an outstanding practice for rusty wallace you got a shot to win this thing tomorrow night rusty yeah i got a real good shot to win i got a good car we got a tune on it just a little bit it was a little tight getting into three tighter than i wanted to be uh we're going to change the gear try to turn the motor up just a little bit more uh, and go find, go sit on a computer and play with it and fine tune the thing a little bit try a couple ideas but all in all, uh, I'm pretty good. Not feeling real comfortable sitting inside. I've got to adjust my belts right, a couple ergonomic stuff, you know. But other than that, that was a good run. Larry Mack said you sucked up really well to other cars, and Jeff Hammond also pointed out you could run pretty much anywhere you wanted to on the track. Was that true? Well, I did. I, I ran the top lane on purpose. I ran the middle lane a little bit. And I felt really, really good until I get ready to stop. And I went to turn three, and I tried a, re a late entry into three, went to pull it down, and I lost the front end just a little bit getting into three. But... A lot of times, if you don't get into turn three and load the car just a certain way, at Daytona that'll happen because it's pretty rough getting into there. But we're going to go back and try to get that out of it. It's going to get tighter tonight. The track's going to cool off. It's real slimy right now, and I've been here enough to know that's what's going to happen. So we'll go work on it a little bit. People say he's never won a points playing restrictor pay, or points paying restrictor plate race, but he has won the Bud Shootout before. Don't forget that, Matt. Marty, the guy who had the best finishing average last year on the restrictor plate tracks, not Dale Jr., not Michael Walter, but Kevin Harvick, and you're also first on the leaderboard today. Your car's up on jack stands. Are you done for this session, Kevin? Yeah, we're done for this session. We're just trying to figure out what uh, what gear we need to run in this GM Gooder and Chevrolet. So, uh, went high, we went low, we went all over the board. So, um, hard to tell anything unless you get all the cars out there in double files. So, we're just kind of taking our best educated guess, and whether that's right or wrong, I don't know, but... Uh, just good to be back in the car. One big question mark going into this session, tires. 25 laps on your set, are they done? Anything left? Uh, ours are wore out, so um, I know the 20 about hit the wall, I about hit the wall, and, and they, they push really bad. You just lose the front end terrible, so it'll definitely be a four-tire pit stop race. We'll pass that on the tie barrier. Definitely four, Larry Mack. Yeah, the 29 I, I don't think there's no question. When you figure they're wearing and when you figure how much these cars, how you have to be able to maneuver them. You know, it's not necessarily that new tires will make you faster here. It just makes it where you can drive it and maneuver that race car. And Larry Mack, 
like you know when it comes to restricted play racing aerodynamics so important sometimes it's not really the driver that's the most important person adam meyer here in the rcr camp here talking to todd barrier you know who he is, Larry Mack, from your time at RCR. Yeah, I mean, he's the lead fabricator at Richard Childress Racing. He pretty much masterminds all the building of all their race cars, whether it's super speedway or whether it's uh, downforce cars. And you always see Adam. You only see him at four races a year. That's the four restrictor plate racetracks. Kenny Schrader leading this draft. New Schwann's colors on his uh, BAM Racing Dodge number 49. And right behind Terry Labonte, the Kellogg Chevy is sixth fastest on the speed chart in this opening round of Bud Shootout practice. Another round coming up under the lights a little later on here on speed. You know, Jeff, I hear a lot of them playing with gear ratio down there. And you know, it's not that necessarily one gear will make you faster or slower, but you're trying to find that compromise. If you knew you were going to be in a draft the whole time or you were going to be leading the pack, you may pull a little bit higher gear. But you know, especially to make that pit stop, and if you lose the draft, you're going to use a little bit lower gear. Now, these cars you're addressing, talking about turning up the RPMs, they're not turning those 9,000 or 9,500 like they do at unrestricted racetrack with this, this restrictor plate. It's about 7,000, 71, 7,200 RPMs make maximum power. You're exactly right. And I just had a report come over my headset said Ace car may be smoking just a little bit. I don't know if he's got a tire rub or maybe he got together with a little bit of somebody out there on the track a second and make it a pass. But what you're alluding to is exactly right. You want to get the car where to pull up off the corner like you want it to as far as the torque is concerned, make it run off the corner hard. When you get halfway down the back straightaway, you want to have the ability to be able to pull out and pass. So finding that right gear combination is very critical if you want to be able to have the best car as far as both ends of the racetrack. Matt? Jeff Hammond several times during this practice session, Dale Jr. said he, he has seen smoke here or there. In fact, he just came out to his radio and said to Stevie Reeves, the spotter, that's the car behind me. I don't know which one it is, but am I smoking it? Smoked it pretty good right now. And Stevie reported back, that team says they saw nothing. A lot of cooperation in practice because everybody wants their working environment to be as safe as possible. They'll help each other out. Hey, that's Buddy Baker in a red shirt there. How about that? We'll be right back. Channel coverage of Bud Shootout practice is brought to you by New Levitra. New choice here now. Ask your doctor today. And by Nextel, coast to coast walkie talkies in under a second. NASCAR and Nextel, partners in speed. Bud Shootout practice uh, this round drawing to a close. We're going to be back with you a little later on under the lights for round two of Bud Shootout practice on Speed Channel this evening. It's about dinner hour here on the East Coast. Things will start getting kind of dark, and these cars will start getting the benefit of some cooler temperatures, run a little quicker. We'll see a little sparks as they go through practice session, because a lot of these guys have been talking about bottoming out. Remember the lights here at Daytona, you can definitely see the fireworks. Least amount of laps run in this session, Dale Jarrett and Jimmy Johnson at 16. Most amount of laps, Boris said 31. He just keeps logging laps out there, keeps getting used to how the car feels in different configurations. It will feel different. If you're at the bottom with cars above you, it's going to drive different. If you're at the top side of the racetrack with someone below you, it's going to drive different. Hey guys, I don't know what Bobby Labonte was doing that time. When he came off the turn four out there, I noticed he put his hand out the window just for a second, like he was kind of motion over you under Dave, Dave Blaney in the 23 card. I thought maybe he was going to come on down and try to get the low line to do something, maybe running a uh, fuel mileage check or something with the 18 card. He was just trying to get position and try to get in behind him and finish up this practice session. Marty? Jimmy McMurray will be driving in the Bud Shootout, the first car he ever drove in a Winston Cup race, but uh, how was it in the first few practice uh, moments there, Jamie? When we first went out, the car was just real tight. Um, really, since we've been here, I think they've added a half-inch of spoiler to the rear. So we kind of expected that a little bit, but we made some changes. And really, it's one of the first times at a super speedway that we've changed something that I could feel it. So um, pretty encouraging. I think our car is, is going to be really good. It looks good. It's got the big star back on the hood, so that's uh, that's pretty cool to have that. You think the fact that you were able to make changes chassis-wise to the cars because of the fact that we have the new tires and it makes everything different? 
I don't know about the tires here because I think they're real similar compared to some of the other tracks that we go to, but um, still kind of fighting the same thing. The right front tire wants to blade real bad. And um, we made our last change. I tried to simulate like a green flag pit stop and I flat spotted a little bit. We pulled back out on the track, but the third time it you know, sort of was totally different. So we decided to call it quits for this practice. We're gonna change a few other things. Um, just kind of go more in the same direction of, of what we did the first time. One of the things also seems to be gear ratio. Everybody's selecting different gear ratios. Is that to get out of the pits better for tomorrow night or what is that for? No, your RPM stays so close here that wherever peak horsepower is where you try to stay at. Um, it's kind of odd for us because we're turning more RPMs than we typically do. And I mean, they asked me what I wanted to do and I wanted to put more gear in it because it seemed like I needed a little more help off the corner. So um, the, the wind's blowing a different direction than what it typically does here. It's blowing down the back stretch. So um, it's part of the reason we're turning so many RPMs, but that's, I don't know, it, it's crazy here because in a lot of racetracks, it seems like gear, gears don't do a lot. Um, but here, it's, it's pretty critical. So um, don't worry about leaving the pits, just, just what you can do on the track. Well, fellas, let me ask you, Larry and Jeff, chasing the racetrack on an 85 degree day, you're gonna run here at about 40 degrees tomorrow night. Can you, can you chase your tail or but wait Mike, till tonight. You got to realize something. Some of these guys are thinking about next week and taking notes that may give them some advantage for next week if the same kind of conditions consist are there for the 500. That's what Kevin Harvick was telling me earlier. Now, if some of the guys, they'll start thinking, yeah, well, yeah, we're worried about tomorrow night and we're going to have to worry about that tonight. So they're going to take a lot of this information. Anytime you're making laps, you're accumulating information. That's what the whole thing is all about. Take the information, document what's going on, and use it when you need to. That's why I'm glad I get to ask the questions, and I have two experts up here <laughs> who have the answers. And if we don't have the answer, we'll make one of them. <laughs> or we'll call DW. There you go. But yeah, I mean, Mike, you know you have to go out there and practice. Like Jeff talked earlier, so many of these cars, like Mark Martin, it's a brand-new race car. There is a lot of things you can learn as far as the car sucking up, things you may do need to do to the air in the cowl area. Yeah, maybe when it comes to exact handling, springs, possibly things like that, maybe engine tuning, you're gonna have to pay more attention to what happens in that next hour practice later on this evening. To get a lot of the little details worked out as far as the fender rubs on the new cars, getting the guys, just get everything kind of close or trying to narrow down like shock packages. You take the opportunity to run through two or three shock packages during this run. To make sure your tire wear is where you want it to be as far as the camera is concerned. A lot of little things that will let you focus in on other details later on this evening will be what's important. And we'll have that hour for you live at 6.30 right here on Speed, 6.30 Eastern Time. Bill Elliott, Tony Stewart, Mark Martin. Dodge Chevy Ford. All in a row. You know, almost everyone in this field tomorrow night, they will have a teammate. Not that teammates can help you in a 70 lap shootout. You know, about the only drivers that don't have a teammate is Dave Blaney, Kevin Harvick, Kenny Schrader, Jimmy McMurray, and then Mark Martin theoretically does not have a teammate because none of the other Roush cars are in the butt shootout. But does it count right now since Roush and Yates have kind of pulled their engine deal together that they're kind of like teammates, distant I, teammates? I would say very distant, especially in this short of a race. Only common denominator may be the fact that blue oval on the hood. You got forward. Cousins when it comes time to read the will, <laughs> if you will. There's a, a technology transfer agreement among the Ford teams, similar to what has existed for some time among the General Motors teams and what the Dodge teams have. It applies to engine technology. Roush going to share some chassis information with the H teams. But the rumor that surfaced on the internet right, that Roush was going to take over the running of Robert Yates race cars, totally unfounded. And they've been stressing the point that those remain completely separate operations. And the biggest thing, they're just going to share an engine shop. That's where the biggest uh, sharing is going to be. So Kevin Harvick is quickest in this first practice session. Rusty Wallace, Boris Set, Bill Elliott, Mark Martin, Terry Labonte, Jeff Gordon, Dave Blaney, the fastest eighth, then Jamie McMurray and Tony Stewart, the top ten. So rejoin us at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time for round two of Bud Shootout Practice on Speed.